and what's really interesting is it, it's a similar conversation between the barista and the producer is that on, on both ends, origin or destination, right? Labor is being um, exploited. Exploited. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Ford, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and I really hope you're enjoying this series as much as Brian and I are having in having this conversation. It is awesome, Brian, in this episode, as we continue our discussion about whether specialty coffee is a viable business model or just an expensive hobby, we're going to bring the producer into the conversation. And we're asking the question, if the producer is suffering under this expectation of the specialty coffee movement, what are your thoughts around that now that you are a part of the industry? So Lee, while I was excited about all of the topics of all of the podcasts, and I'm certain that this is no surprise to you or even to some of the, uh, your <laughs> listeners, um, this is the one about which I am most yeah, passionate. Yeah, I figured. Um, I, and we may have even talked about it when we first connected and had the podcast. But again, back to this idea of the metaphors. And for me, the, the metaphor that I like to use when it comes to specialty coffee is the music industry. Mm. In my, from my perspective, the same way that you cannot build a music industry for the long term and continue to exploit artists, right? The same way that you cannot continue to have writers and actors and mm -hmm. exploit that talent, we cannot have a specialty coffee industry and exploit specialty coffee producers. Mm -hmm. Not only, not only can you not, we not only we, should we not, but ultimately we cannot. And I think this is another one of those opportunities where when we properly pay for coffee, it's going to be a fundamental shift for the industry. And that means a lot of things. I think that means we are going to see fewer specialty coffee cafes. I think we're going to see fewer roasters. I think we're going to see fewer producers. But I think that is the nature of being true to the value chain, making sure everyone is properly compensated. Mm -hmm. And then really being able to uphold specialty. Because if we jump all the way back, like we have to remember, coffee is a product for which we have never properly compensated the labor, ever. And as a result of then, so we're talking about something that went from being commercial with exploited labor. So now we're trying to, we're trying to work out specialty and we're still exploiting labor. And so we keep asking ourselves, well, Part of the reason is, well, why can't we build businesses? Well, because we're now building businesses where we're trying to charge premiums and we're still exploiting the labor. Mm -hmm. And if we stop doing that, again, it's going to fundamentally, it's going to be one of those things that fundamentally disrupts the industry, much as the way we saw happen in the music industry. I mean, you know, consumers got tired of buying $20 CDs mm -hmm. and having three singles on them, feeling like there's just no value in this. Mm -hmm. And so the disassociation of the album, iTunes ability to go and sell the single. So now I can go and buy the thing that I want, created a convenience and an experience piece for customers. Now, we're still working out this issue around equity for artists, right? That still has not been solved. We're still not properly compensating songwriters, artists, et cetera. But that kind of disruption that we saw, the kind of disruption we saw with writers, the fact that the in the U.S. we still see the Screen Actors uh, Guild, the actors are their their talks resume this week, um, but the exploitation of labor is just something that customers care more and more about. And in specialty, the people right, the people who are going to come and pay that six dollars, eight dollars for the cup of coffee, they're going to start asking questions about your your value chain and your supply chain. And if those things don't work out, there's gonna there's gonna be a rub, right? Or, or even if you have this real mix where, you know, so you've got these fancy micro lots, but then if your, your blends for your, you know, kind of your tried and true, your stable coffees, but if you're not properly paying for those, so all of a sudden I can come and buy a $19 cup of coffee from your shop, but I can still buy a $2 cup of coffee. That math doesn't math. Mm -mm. And so really to make specialty coffee successful for me, you have to center the producer. No one says it better. And, and I always give credit because this is the first time it ahad for me it was when I went to George Howell in Acton, Massachusetts. It was the Godfrey Hotel location. And it said, uh, putting coffee farmers front and center where they belong. 
And so when I first, and, and that's the thing that from the first time I saw that Lee, I've never forgotten it. And that as a consumer, I, that for me became the mantra through which I started to consume coffee. Was the producer front and center? Was the producer's name being hidden? What are, are is the information about the price paid for the coffee being hidden? Do I see in social media for producers that have access, right? And they, they have a presence. Do I see them, uh, you know, um, talking about their relationship with a particular with a particular roaster, right? Where I see equity in the relationships, I feel good about voting with my dollar. Mm. And, and so I think that right now, yes, in specialty, producers are still being harmed by the prices being paid. I mean, you know, and what's really interesting is it, it's a similar conversation between the barista and the producer is that on, on both ends, origin or destination, right? Labor is being um, exploited. exploited. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Mapper Forward's first on-demand workshop, How to Become a Coffee Consultant, available now online for you to learn at your own pace with a certificate available upon completion. Click the link in the show notes to access today for just 50 euros. Thank, right. Labor is being exploited. And so to, to build in this industry, and interestingly enough, back to, to your comment about fine dining, we're seeing a number of fine dining establishments that are going Close. under. Right. Because they were dependent upon free labor from people who wanted to work at some Staging. of these restaurants. Yeah. Right. Right. For the for the benefit of the ability to put it on my resume. So, but again, you're you're doing that under free labor. And so um as I think we see um relationships. Uh, so again, back to this idea of the metaphor, um, the one I often talk about now is I think about the producer as the artist and the roaster is the venue. So I want to go see a particular artist. Um, again, I'm in New York City. So if I want to see a particular jazz artist at the Village Vanguard, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, now I'm seeing my favorite producer being roasted by my, by my favorite roaster. Now, there's another jazz club, right? I, me, personally, I'm not a fan of the Blue Note. I just, it's, it's just not my thing. Mm -hmm. So if I see an artist I really love, but they're playing at the Blue Note, I'm not going. Mm -hmm. Just like there are certain roasters who may roast a coffee that I love. I love that coffee. I love that producer. I'm not buying it because that that's not the venue for me. And so I think, again, we're going to, as the industry evolves equitably, I think we see roasters beginning to work with smaller groups of producers mm -hmm. so that we're seeing those names again and again and again. And again, I just go back to my experience with George Howell, the Walter Mathago Mamuto, I've now been buying for about 11 years. Yeah, the it is the only thing. Kenyan coffee, right? It's the only Kenyan coffee that I buy. One of the reasons I do that is because, and I've never heard anything otherwise, but George Howell every year buys the entire lot. Mm -hmm. uh, by, right, buys the, I'm sorry, by not the lot, I'm sorry, the, but the harvest. Like Howell buys all of that and the, price, the, the, the quality will sometimes fluctuate, but that's the commitment. And so Part of the reason I continue to buy Mamuto is because that's my way of trying to say to, to George Howell Coffee, I support what you're doing with the Mathagu family. Mm -hmm. I support what you're doing with Mamuto. And so you really want specialty, right? Specialty, part of specialty is this idea of engendering loyalty. Mm. Well, if roasters are constantly changing the producers with whom we're working, well, it's it's hard for me to then say, okay, well, I, you know, I, I thought that you, you know, you had this thing that I liked last year. Right, the seasonal. Uh, where is that? Up, oh, we we went with someone else. Well, but if it was special then, why isn't it special now? Right, and so I'm looking for that continuity as a way of showing loyalty and commitment, and that's part of again when I come, that's that special relationship that I want to participate in, or as a a home barista, that's the kind of of value chain I want to co labor in as I collaborate in that process. You know, when you first came on the podcast, the the one, um, the one, the main feedback that we got was Brian is like the perfect specialty coffee customer. He really gets what we do, and I really love this analogy that you've got happening between the coffee industry and the music industry. As I'm in the middle of writing my next album, and I'll be recording it and releasing it when I'm in living in Dubai, 
This is the first time I've said this on the podcast. I will be living in Dubai. When this airs, I will have just moved to Dubai. And I'm going to be writing an album in the desert, recording it and releasing it and gigging it in the desert. But the reason I bring this up, and guys, you can go check out all my music on Spotify. The reason I bring this up is because there was a point When a lot of musicians realized this was becoming an expensive hobby, no matter how much I wanted to commit to this being my business, the reality of it was, given the shift in the business model, making and releasing music is an expensive hobby. And if you, for me, the game changer was when Jay-Z came out and he said, the music model is broken, there's no more money in music. And you think, if jay Z is saying that, I have to accept that. I have to accept that no matter what my commitment is to this, the deepest love of my life, which is music, if I'm going to do this, I have to accept that there's going to be a relationship between me and my customers who are the people who consume my music, that they are going to consume it for next to nothing and they consume it by the millions. But... That is not of any financial gain to me. When I was shortlisted for the Twilight soundtrack, my song was listened to 9 million times in one week. You know how much money I made out of that on a streaming service? Hmm. 28 cents. Hmm. 28 cents. And you just have to come to the reality of understanding that if this is something that you want to do, Is it a viable business opportunity or is it something that's an expensive hobby? And a lot of coffee producers are coming to realize that if I'm going to produce specialty coffee, I either have to prioritize marketing and start going on world tours and make myself famous Mm -hmm. so that I can sell my product. And then they come to me and they say, but Lee, I'm not interested in being famous. I'm just interested in producing coffee. And for me, that was the same thing. I'm not interested in being famous. I'm just interested in putting my songs front and center. When when I do a gig, the whole room is emotional. That's all I care about. They're connecting with the music. But I have to do that at the sacrifice of making me famous and I wasn't interested. Because that's not what's important to me. When the coffee producer realizes that they have to go and do a world tour and front up all of this money and sponsor barista champions and do all this fuckery, a lot of them are saying, it's not worth it. I'd rather strip pick my coffee, Mm -hmm. also grow mangoes Mm -hmm. and just send my coffee to the commercial market. Mm -hmm. And I don't know which is right and which is not right. I All I can tell you is from my perspective, I make a really good living in the coffee industry. I make no living in the music industry, but my heart and my soul is in this piano that's behind me. Yeah. And my heart and my soul is with my clients, but not the same way that it is with my piano. And you have to get real about the business models. It doesn't mean that you're any more or less committed to one or the other. But the reality reality of it is, much like Brian, you are a deeply committed specialty coffee consumer because you love this whole process. The people who are actually the bread and butter, the consumers who are the bread and butter of our industry, are the complete opposite of you. They drink a cappuccino with two sugars and they give zero fucks about where they get it from. And that hurts. As an industry, that hurts. And we've got to get very real about like how are we building these business models of the future? I don't know. And and that's just we we have to build them. You know, it's interesting. um, Two things. I I think that another example, and I don't have the numbers Mm -hmm. um, to be able to really kind of talk about the kind of success we're seeing, but with these realizations come new platforms. So you think mm-hmm. about something like Patreon, which is where now, so you may have artists who say, listen, right. I want to be able to, I want to be able to earn something from my music. So even if I have 10,000 fans, mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. right? If I, but if I have 10,000 fans and my 10,000 fans are willing to give me 50 cents a month, mm-hmm. right? All of a sudden, I've got $5,000 a month in revenue from doing the thing that I love. Now, mm-hmm. um, is it work to get 10,000 fans? It is. But that also goes so back to my idea. Work. Right. But it, it's still it's also that new customer acquisition strategy, right? right. It's, the listeners are the customers. And so but the emergence of, of platforms like Patreon are in direct response to the, the idea of the, the big label deal and making money and getting that advance, right? That's no longer the reality. No. But is there something, is there a different kind of ecosystem where I, I can take the fans that I have, right? Not have a major deal, release something kind of as I go. I don't have to wait to release an album. I can go kind of single at a time. Mm-hmm. I can release some other things if I do a, a video or something like that and get a committed community. Again, I may not make superstar money, but I may be able to earn enough to, to pay justify rent. living, right? Doing doing what I want to do. And so- mm-hmm. You know, and I th- the question that you you brought up about about coffee producers, I think, is another one. Back to this idea of what is your customer acquisition strategy? Because again, I think historically we've had people kind of go to producers and say, "I'm willing to give you this money, right? This is what I'm willing to give you, right? Be now you have to be a price taker to say, okay, this is what you're giving me, okay, this is I guess what I can get, and then my coffee goes. Versus the producers who are doing that work building brands for themselves, recognizing themselves as businesses who are then able to charge a premium, right? But in the premium being paid, and, and again, we can get into right, the, 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 the philosophical um, uh, argument here, which is, is the premium being paid for the name mm-hmm. or is it just being paid for the quality of the coffee? Because the reality of the matter is the premium paid should be for the quality of the coffee. But just as we know, the highest paid artists are not the most talented, yeah. right? Right. Um, but we're recognizing that, that in building that brand, that's what enables them to justify the premium and to differentiate and enable them to be price makers instead of price takers. And so I think this idea of you know, developing your customers and, and getting customers to come to you, just like we're suggesting that the cafe owners have to do it. I mean, the question is, how do we create opportunities for producers to build those brands, for producers to build that awareness so that they, we can get rid of some of this asymmetrical power structure where they can only take love what's it. offered as opposed to setting prices for themselves? Yeah, love it. Folks, we've got one. Sadly, we have only one episode left of this series. Please join us in the next episode where we're going to talk about kind of wrapping this whole discussion up. What needs to change for specialty coffee business owners now that we've talked about all of this stuff we're going to ask brian what needs to change so join us for the last episode of this series peace love and peanut butter have an amazing rest of your day thanks friends if you enjoyed this video here's what you should check out next consider supporting mapper forward on patreon and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell before you leave